Life is unfair, but in order to make the best of it, there are certain things you need to know. Tune in now as I talk to Dick DeVos. Uncommon Sense with Junior Doan, sharing the wisdom and insight of those who have been there and done that. everybody and welcome back to Uncommon Sense. A warm welcome to those of you who are tuning in for the very first time. We hope you will continue to do so and become part of our Uncommon Sense family. This is a program about real life, real people as it's lived in the early part of the 21st century. We have as our guest today Dick DeVos who is willing and we thank him enormously to share his experience and wisdom with us as our other guests have. Dick has a very interesting background. For 10 years, he was head of Amway and its successor or combination company, Altacar. But I tell you what I admire about Dick and why I invited him to be on the program. First of all, I like his smile. So, <laughs> true. Now, this is always good because you know I always tell you to smile. And secondly, I like his engaging and willing way. And the other thing I admire about him is his real adoption and living in his life good values, his real interest in people, in family, and in education. So welcome, Dick. Well, I'm thank especially you. Thank happy you. you're here. Well, thank you for those <laughs> and welcome kind, to Midland. Very well, thank you for those very kind words. It's great to be back in Midland. Thank you. Um, when you were, well, when you were with Amway and you're now doing other things, mm -hmm. Amway went to China. Mm -hmm. um, that was definitely a new experience than operating in the U.S. What did you learn about operating in China? How do they think it's different than we think? Well, China, I, I think we have to uh, say, talk about China in two different ways. There's China uh, as in the Chinese culture, and right. then there is China as in the People's Republic of China. Mm. Because there are, there are two layers to what happens in China today. And it was my privilege when working for Amway, which is now Altacor, uh, to work in the, the China cultural context for over 30 years of mm -hmm. uh, working with, uh, with ethnic Chinese people. So that was uh, a real insight into the Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. And many people think that, that Amway and, and, and the Amway business was a uh, very American idea, which it was. But today the company is oh, just approaching 80% of its sales outside of North America. So it's very much an international company and very pervasive across the Pacific. So the company has done business in, for many years now in People's Republic of China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, as well as other areas. And it's given us some insights into the, the culture of the Chinese people and uh, the governmental structures there. Mm -hmm. It is a different culture, very, very distinct, a wonderful and rich culture. Mm -hmm. And then you have in the People's Republic of China uh, a, an overlay of politics um, and what I refer to as a patina mm -hmm. of communism mm -hmm. that exists over that society. You don't think it's that deep then? I, I think that you have underneath, and what I've observed, having been spent time in both in Russia and the former East and in China, that it's, it's a very, very different underneath communism. You talk about com we talk about communism in this country as though it's the same in every country, and I, I personally find it a deplorable system, but it, it expresses itself differently in different countries. In the Russia and the Eastern Bloc was a different culture than China. In China, there existed a very strong uh, cult Chinese culture that had been there for thousands of years, right. long before communism, of right. course. That it, that was that it was strong families. China was a trading center for the world for yes. many many years. China the, and the Chinese people have a, had a, 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 a rich history of business and selling and marketing and transaction and trading, and all of this has gone on all the way through the communist era in China. So there has always been this sort of bubbling market economy mm -hmm. underneath the political umbrella 
called mm -hmm. communism, which is how now we see China uh, so quickly able to adapt to the marketplace where Russia was not. Um, many people in America, and probably an increasing number, will be starting to talk about what can America do to stay competitive mm -hmm. or be competitive in the future with countries such as China, India, and, and other countries coming forward. Mm -hmm. What does the competitive landscape look like from a business sense in China? Well, I think China represents a huge opportunity for the United States. Mm -hmm. So I would I view China with with an opportunity mindset, mm -hmm. not a, a threatened, scary. Um, this is going to be a terribly difficult for America mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, China has a billion potential customers for our mm -hmm. products. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an exciting thing for American industry and American business, if we can get our heads around it and get focused on it. The thing that has always been the differentiator for America, and I believe will continue to be, despite threats from China and others, uh, to threaten us economically, the real opportunity for America is in our ability to innovate. We are a nation that thinks about possibilities and opportunities in a truly unique way in the world. It's, it's a, it may be it's a culture, it may be it's the politics, the environment we're in. But we pursue opportunities and creativity in a unique way, uh, a historic strength that we have to continue to build on. Do you think uh, we, the country, need to do things like uh, invest more money in research or deregulation or more different ways of educating and interest in yeah. of yours to help amplify and continue that strong tradition. Is there an answer D, all of the above? <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> well, good. I'm yeah. glad to hear that from you. Well, I, I think the research is critically important, not the, the spending on research, but an atmosphere of research, an atmosphere of continued development and innovation. Hmm. You know, we, can, we talk about spending. It's one measure of research. Mm -hmm. But research, you can throw all the money you want, but until you have people whose minds are, are creative and open to new ideas and new ways of thinking, uh, that will truly be the revolution, and then money will follow that. And of course, we need education to be able to sustain those sorts of, of, of minds that have the skill sets that are required. Uh, How to do you keep it. a mind open to research? Well, I think it's open to opportunity. To opportunity. I open to possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, not a mind that is closed or controlled. Mm -hmm. What I see in China and other countries has been a, there, there's, there's a culture, oftentimes, in many other parts of the world, that tends to restrict one's thinking. Mm -hmm. A culture we don't have in this country. A culture that says, if you were the, if your parents were this, then you are that. Right. If, uh, if the government says this, then this is the way it is. Right. In America, we have a different view. It says if you're, what your parents are is an interesting reference point, but right. not controlling. Right. What the government says to us is, that, is, is viewed oftentimes, properly, I would think, with great suspicion. Right. And it, yeah. oftentimes we say, well, if the government says left, then we generally say right, well, right is better. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, right. We'll question. So I think that's the culture that I'm talking about, is that, that culture that, that pushes boundaries. Questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pushes the boundaries out. What were some of the values that your family stressed? stressed? Well, all of those ideas of being able to, to, to push um, in my view and in my family's view from, from our history can only be done from a context of a foundation. You can only push from, the, from a, a, firm, a firm point. And so in my family, faith mm -hmm. was a very important part. It was a, a part that, oriented, that mm -hmm. oriented our world. As Christians, it gave us a particular sort of, of idea of, of how the world was organized and, and where the where the edges were, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, family mm -hmm. and the, the need for all of us to have a, a safe place to go. Uh, a recognition of uniqueness and the possibilities that each person had in my family and maybe in yours. Uh, I have uh, three siblings. Each of us are very different. Same father, same mother, very different. So, well, you have to appreciate right. we're all unique. Right. And everyone brings something special to the family and we try to we try to support that and reinforce that and, and encourage that development. 
Well, you had that that bliss. You had that that security at the beginning. How have you perhaps met an Amway or just in your other interest in education people who have not been blessed that way? Mm. And then how do you give them that kind of platform and that kind of mm. rooted sense? It's hard. It's very very hard to do. And uh, unfortunately, we've uh, the, we've allowed, or it has just occurred to us either way that the, the family structures to break down. Uh, to me, the first thing, one of the first things we need to do as a, a culture uh, has to be to go after doing everything we can so that all that we do can reinforce and build and sustain and support family development. When it breaks down, and it does, people, you know, bad things happen as, right. as we've talked about many times. Tough things can happen. In those cases, then, uh, we need to have uh, people that are willing to step in, and, and oftentimes the, that'll be in the form of a school for a child and for a teacher, a mentor, a special person. What if a, a child can't person. find their way? How, how, what's the best way for them to find a way? Children, I don't think children are able to find a way, certainly not when they're young. They need, a, they need adults to guide and mm -hmm. to direct and to control them because they, they don't know where those reference points are. But I think most of us in our life, whether we grew up in a strong family or not, can reference back to at least one and maybe more people who took a hold of us and who gave us some advice and some perspective. Maybe it's a teacher, a mentor, a friend, an uncle, an aunt, a grandparent. Somewhere in there, somewhere in that child's life, uh, if a person is willing to reach out and help, there is somebody there that can help to guide that child. Some years ago, um, you worked for a partner of Ted's, Arnold Ott. Absolutely. <laughs> what oh, did you Arnold, learn from oh. Arnold? Boy, I could go on all day about what I learned from Arnold Ott. Um, Arnold was a, 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 a gifted, extraordinarily bright uh, man. But the part that I learned uh, uh, from Arnold was uh, I learned about a heart. Arnold cared very much. Um, about people and really engaged with with people and uh, that was a, a tremendous tremendous gift I, I learned about thinking and planning from Arnold Ar Ar Arnold was a very disciplined thinker and uh, I learned a tremendous amount from him in that regard uh, so I'm, I'm forever grateful for what he taught me you know as you think about your life I I wondered um, what some of your mistakes have taught you since we all make mistakes oh. me included. <laughs> More than my successes on average. <laughs> right. You know, um, more than my successes. Yeah, I, um, I guess what I've, uh, what I've learned about myself uh, first is that uh, I am more, I'm more comfortable learning from positive decisions than from not taking the decision. Hmm. Which was an interesting That's insight important. for me. Yeah. That I, I am more comfortable with making a mistake because I thought through the issues, made a decision, and discovered maybe it wasn't a good decision. As opposed to just either reacting and not thinking, or just not acting and allowing events to overtake right. me. In which case then I start, you feel like a victim and you get yourself into a pretty negative spiral. Mm -hmm. So. My view was if I'm going to make a mistake, I'm going to make a mistake knowing what I'm doing and knowing I'm going a direction. And when I thought it through and I knew why I did something, I have a much better ability then to discern why it was it didn't work and to learn. You know, sometimes we choose to learn things, but sometimes life teaches us things. Mm -hmm. What, what is, has life taught you, separate from what you just mentioned? Um, life has taught me that um, that it's short, mm. uh, that's far too short. Um, life is, uh, has taught me that it, uh, it's not fair. Mm. A classic in our household, our right. classic in our household is kids, our kids always say, well, that's not fair. Right, yeah. And our response oftentimes is life's not fair. In fact, we have a, a, we have a buzzword in our house. Um, we say is life's not fair and the, 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 the kids don't even say the last part which is shut up and get in the car <laughs> because what happened was that we had a, we had some uh, our kids were standing and there were some other kids that right. that were around and there were two grandmothers 
uh, waiting for a, a, the, a car to come and pick them up. And, the, and some of the, the grandmothers were commiserating, and one was saying about how the kids were behaving badly, and they had to go home, and other kids that were being treated differently, and it just didn't seem fair. And said to the one other grandmother, what do you say in that situation when kids say it's just not fair? And I say, she looked at her and said, well, I just say to them, life's not fair. Shut up and get in the car. <laughs> <Right. laughs> yeah. and so in our house, life's not fair. Just shut up and get Do in the car. Do it anyway. You've got to just accept that is the basis. It's not going to be fair. You just have to try to make good decisions as best you're able. Unfortunate, sad things happen. My father went through a yeah. tremendous heart problems, and then at the end of it had a wonderful gift of a heart transplant. Um, it seemed very un so very unfair for a long time. But yet now, he has this tremendous gift. So we don't know how these things are going to work out. Uh, we believe, again, to go back to that, you go back and you put your foot on that thing that, that you, the cornerstone in your life, if you have one, for us, it's our faith. You put your, your, your foot on it and said, you know, we believe things generally will come together for good, even though we don't think every situation is good. Eventually, some good will come. We have to look for it. What do you try and teach your children? Oh, that's another long story. Okay. <laughs> you got four. You got a yeah, lot of practice. We there. have four children, and uh, uh, our eldest has uh, just graduated university. Our youngest oh. is still in middle school, so we have a bit of a we have a bit of a span. But uh, two things that that I sort of try to communicate is that one again goes back to the faith perspective that says there is a God, and it's not you, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not me. All right. But you have accountability to a higher standard mm -hmm. beyond yourself. It isn't all about you. It isn't all about what feels good to you. It isn't, it isn't all about what makes your day. You have an accountability to a higher standard. Be aware of that. And that secondly, if you believe there is a God, then, and you believe that, they, that, that God created people, that you stand shoulder to shoulder with everyone, no matter what their gifts, no matter what their job, no matter what their family, no matter what their color or their economics, you stand with the same architect that they had shoulder to shoulder. And don't ever forget that. Did they believe you? Oh, absolutely. Good. And the key is when you watch them, how do they treat? How do others. they deal and engage with others? And we're very proud. We're very blessed. How did you handle, uh, maybe you never had a family fight with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't lie. <laughs> but, you know, this is an issue every parent faces. How did you resolve those, those conflicts? How did you teach your children to resolve them? The most dangerous fight is the fight that's never finished. Mm. Where lingering hurt goes on mm -hmm. and it's never brought to a conclusion. A disagreement left open can fester and eventually cancer can grow. So the challenge is to have us help. And, and I don't do this well either. It's, it's something I have to work on too, to finish the fight. To determine and say, OK, we have a disagreement. Instead of going away mad, mm -hmm. to have the discipline to say, what do we need to do to resolve this so it can work out for you and work out for me. Can we find a way to make this work? And is that going to mean a little adjustment? Is it going to mean um, understanding my feelings, a better understanding your feelings? It pushes into some new areas. But you have to finish to bring it to a conclusion. So people feel peaceful about it. So people, yeah, and understand there's closure. They can feel a peace about it. They may not be happy. Right. But they're at peace, then they know what the outcome is, they know the situation, they know the score. How do you handle people and how did you advise your children to handle people who um, use put downs, uh, denigration, unkindness? Mm. That's very hard and in our situation um, our children are subject to a bit of that, un in their case very unfairly. They're, we live in Grand Rapids um, our family is relatively, our family name is relatively well known in that community. Um, our children are criticized because maybe what their parents or grandparents did or didn't do. Mm -hmm. They didn't have anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. And yet sometimes someone will say us, give them a snide remark or, or, or uh, not try to build a friendship because of some perceptions. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, what we just try to, to talk to them about is that, that, that again, this is, this is not about you. Right. It's about the other person. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that's a perception they have or a hurt they have right. that is in their life. And you can't, you can't take that on yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to be kind, but you just have to continue on then with your life and understand that it's, it's not your fault, it's not your problem. Um, what can you tell me about uh, building a good marriage? <laughs> well, we're covering the entire waterfront here, aren't we? That's life. Well, it is. It is, and critically important. Right. In, in, uh, critically important. Probably the most, the best thing that Betsy and I have done is that we sit down, and over the last probably hmm. four to five years, and we just celebrated our 25th anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. Three to four times a year, we sit down with a counselor. Now, for some people, that would make them very nervous. Or they'd say, well, what do you mean you have a counselor? That must mean you have tremendous problems in your marriage. Right. And we, can, we, we refer to it, frankly, as a marriage tune-up. Mm -hmm. It's preventative maintenance. Mm -hmm. Just like on your car, you change the oil, you update things to make it run better, to allow everything to work better. In a marriage, when you introduce a wise third party mm -hmm. whom you trust, that you can talk to, about the communication styles and mm -hmm. patterns that you develop. Talk to about issues with children. Get advice, help you to work things out together. It's preventive maintenance, probably the best thing that we've ever done. Well, that is a really good suggestion to keep things going smoothly. It, you know, to always oh, never let things balloon into exactly, something exactly. huge. Exactly. Handle a problem, you know, when it's just a little pimple it, right it is and it's it, it seems almost inevitably that about a week or two before we're going to have our you know, we, we we're going to meet with with our counselor something will happen in our relationship <laughs> that will that will give us a good discussion at that Boy, at that <laughs> meeting inevitably it happens which is great what are the steps that you take to make a decision and do you teach that to others through education i mean how do you make a decision what, what, what oh. happens to you? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I am, you know, Arnold tried to teach me a certain amount of discipline in, that, in the decision-making process. And so for me, uh, I try to be sure that I, have, uh, that I have good data. I try to be sure that I've explored all the alternatives. And then the, the third challenge is that I try to follow what the Marines call the 70% rule which is that once you've achieved 70% of the necessary data to make a decision, make a decision and begin moving. Hmm. Don't wait for 80 or 90% of the data that you need because when you wait that long, it's probably too late. Don't be afraid to act and then adjust. You'll be able to make that decision, make it knowing that you're going to have lots of other decisions to change mm. and adjust your course as you go. But if you wait for everything to be so clear that there's no risk involved, mm -hmm. it's probably too late. Hmm. Interesting theory, isn't it? Oh, it's a wonderful theory. I've not heard yeah. about that, it's, Marine. A, it's great counsel yeah. for businessmen, but I think it's good counsel in life, too. When you make a decision, you invariably you're going to have to make adjustments based on that, that pesky thing called reality. Yes. that enters in. So don't wait too long. Make a choice, begin moving, and be open then to making the next choice, and the next choice, and the next choice. Did you have to learn that? <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely, because, you, because we, we can tend to do two things. Some people will tend to go off at 20% of inf information. Right. All right? And then there, those are the, the ready, fire, aim right. group, right? Right. And then there's the, uh, there's the other group, that is ready, ready, <laughs> ready, you know, <laughs> and aim, 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 you know, that, that never quite get there. How do you get to that point where you gather the data, explore the alternatives, and make a choice? Do you think those three types of people are drawn to different careers in life? That's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, by my observation, there are tendencies, not yeah. absolute, but there are clearly tendencies. I, for one, have great respect for, uh, for teachers who have a tremendous amount of patience 
with, with kids and with people. I, I don't have that. Uh, they, they, but they have a sanguine personality. They have a gentleness of, about them that I don't naturally have in me. How do you channel your impatience? How do you use that energy? Well, uh, that's exactly what you try. Try to use it positively, not negatively, and try to channel it. Try to use that about me, not about others. What do you mean by that? My tendency, because I'm impatient and because I have, am, am goal-oriented, my tendency is going to be to place that on others and to hold them accountable to my standards. Mm. Now, in business, you have to hold people accountable. But you can't hold them accountable to all your standards. So my challenge is to hold me accountable to my standards and live by it. Thank you. We want to thank Dick for being with us today. We've learned an immense amount from him. We've, le <coughs> We've learned the 70% rule, <laughs> get your data and move. We've learned to channel um, what could be viewed as a weakness into positiveness, such as impatience, and not lay that on others. We've learned in raising children that life is unfair, and it is in the adult world too, but they have to do it anyway. We've learned to um, not take on other person's negative attitude. He was talking about his children. In his marriage, he talked about being willing uh, to quarterly address whatever kinds of issues, discussions he and his wife need to have. He talked about just sort of the confidence in America, the confidence of can do and creativity. He talked about the importance of in the future of do the research, you know, deregulate, <laughs> do the things that keep our country exactly what it is. And um, the thing I liked especially, and I want you all to, to hear this again from me, is that a decision is better than no decision. Make a decision and act, and he's willing to live with a mistake even though it wasn't. And back to the 70% rule, as he makes the decision, he knows he's going to have to adjust on the way through. So thank you, Dick, and thank you all for listening. Remember, kindness counts. I want you to go out and do something sweet, write a thank you, help someone out, make a phone call, volunteer to help our country be the entrepreneurial a uh, compassionate, helpful country we can and should be. Thank you, and we'll see you another time soon. Thank you, Dick. That was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> to share your comments and suggestions, contact Junior. The email address is juniordoan at aol.com or write to Post Office Box 169, Midland, Michigan, 48640.